out of all the days, the one day I lose my voice is the day I have to be here. So um, if you can't hear me, just you know, go ahead and say I can't hear you, but I'll try to speak as loud as possible. So today's topic is really interesting because you know the word resilient is kind of a buzzword in academia right now. So I started thinking about what does that mean? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to you as a learner? What does that mean to you as faculty members, right? And I actually had to look it up because I thought, when did it become popular? And that's where I started kind of research. And resilience, you know, this idea that to withstand recover or recover quickly from difficult con conditions was really the definition of that. that stuck with me. And if you notice the use of the word, it wasn't really common in the 1800s. But lately, it's, it's a buzzword, you know, it's what does that mean for academia, what does that mean for your success as a student, what does that mean for our future, whatever future you want, right? So that's where I got started, and I started thinking about, well, now that we know what a resilient, and you know, what, what resilience means, a lot of people use the word in different ways, they say, you know, people who can recover quickly, people can, who can, you know, do, kind of take risks and not accept, or fail quickly and move on. And then I started asking myself, who do I know that is one of a prime example of a resilient learner? And I can call myself a resilient learner. I've you know survived a biology, a bachelor's in biology. I say survived because by the end you're like, yes, I survived. You know, it really feels that sense of accomplishment is just there. But there's also my master's level work was also a great accomplishment, and I stuck through that. But the weirdest thing happened to me as a PhD student, because it was so tough. It was so tough. My program was just very, very biology-driven, even though it was an education emphasis as well. But at the end, I felt, it was kind of the weirdest thing, it's like, I have a PhD in biology education, and at the end, that's why I don't even remember my, my day that I graduated. I was done. I was so tired. And I thought, does that mean I'm not a resilient learner anymore? Or does that mean that the conditions were just a little too much to handle? And it felt like a bad relationship, really. But now, two years later, three years later almost, I kind of feel like I've recovered from that. And that's resilient, being a resilient learner. But in thinking about who in my life really, really shows the spirit of resiliency um, is my brother. So notice, in my family, we have five girls and one boy. And he is the only, you know, he's the only boy. And in a Latino family, it was really interesting because he grew up as the king of a house, you know, a very different role when it comes to gender roles and things like that. So it's like everything was handed to him. You know, everything was like, what do you need? My mom would even dress him in his bed when he was little. I'm like, mom, why do you do that, you know? Oh, well, he, you know, he needs a little more sleep. I'm like, you never did that with me. And then I started comparing how my mom was raising the girls versus how, how she was raising the boy. And the funniest, weirdest thing that happened was that her enabling him actually made him a less resilient learner because he expected things to be handed to him. And I get this complaint from faculty members a lot. You know, our students expect us to hand them things. And it's like, have you thought about what you're asking these faculty members to do? And then have you thought about what you expect those faculty members to do for you, right? So long story made short, we are all first generation college students. We were, most of us were born and raised in El Salvador, except for my little sister. She's actually in high school right now. She, is, she wants to be a surgeon, um, which is really neat because here we have my <coughs> sister Ruth. She um, used to work as one of the heads for Kaiser. She has a master's in nursing administration. So she has a BSN and a master's in nursing. And then my little sister, um, Martha, she is an elementary school teacher. And then it's me, and I, I have my own business. I own a company called STEM Learning by Design. And then my second sister, Karina, she's a social worker that works for Children's Hospital of Orange County in Los Angeles. And my brother, you wonder what happened to him, right? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you my, my brother's story because I think it's really important. You might actually find a connection to it. You might actually know, know a, his name is Juan. You might actually have a Juan in your life in one way or another. You might be Juan, you know, so think about it that way. So Juan, Juan graduated from high school with a 1.2 GPA. I know, and I don't, I don't even know how he got behind. And I remember his principal saying, and for those of you who barely made it, 
congrats to you. And we're like, yeah, that's my brother. And I had to stop and say to myself, that's kind of sad. It's kind of sad that we're celebrating that he barely made it out of high school. So what were his educational opportunities? I don't know, what would you suggest? What could he do? He's out of high school, 1.2 GPA. Now what? Where does he work? Throw some ideas out. What would you do if you had a 1.2 GPA? And what's next after that? Service industry. Perhaps vocational school, yeah. Military. Military, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, my <laughs> No, but it was a real question, and it's a real question in this community. Really think about it. You know, we're in a space where all of you probably passed that point in a way, but there are still, some of you might be in remedial courses because of the same reason, right? So he decided to go to community college. He said, fine, you know, I, don't, I can't get into a four-year, but I know I can get community college. Anybody can get into community college. So he went. And what happened his first semester? He failed out. And so I left him. You know, I was doing my bachelor's in biology, so I let him be. And I said, OK, you know, my brother's doing his thing. I don't want to mess with that. I'm going to do my thing, continue with that. Well, what happened was um, after he when, he, when he turned 20, I asked him, he worked, he actually worked for the service industry in a way. He actually worked for Sears, not serving food, but actually servicing cars. And he was changing tires. And he was bright, like he could fix a car like no other. So I asked him, I said, why do you do that? Like, why do you fix cars? He goes, I just love the way they work. He goes, I love the way you can take them apart, put them back together. And then I said, so why are you looking for Sears? If you know that that's the talent you have, why can't you go do something else? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, I don't know what people do with my type of talent. <coughs> and I said, have you heard of mechanical engineers? And he was like, no, I haven't. And I said, OK. I said, why did you fail out? Do you know why you failed? And he said, I never learned to study. He goes, I got by, literally. He came to the US from El Salvador in second grade. From second grade to, to 12th grade, he got by. He said, he was really bright, right? But there's this sense of like, I'm gonna figure out a way to, um, I'm gonna figure out a way to get by without really thinking about working towards what I need to accomplish. So he never, he never explored careers. He never knew what that was, right? So I said, what could I do? I graduated with a biology degree. No idea what I, could, what I wanted to do. So I said, I don't know. Maybe I'll look into teaching. I don't want to go into med medical school. Most people go into medical school with biology degree. So what can I do? So I said, you know, in the meantime, I said. What can I do to help you? And he said, well, I don't know how to study. I don't know how to take notes. I don't know how to take tests. And I'm like, how did you get by? Like, this is surreal to me. Living in the same house, how two people could have been raised so different, right? But it goes back to that learned helplessness. My mom inculcating that. Like, I do everything for you. I'm sure she probably did her homework, too. I just didn't really notice. So I said, OK, you're too, you're too talented to just let that go to waste, right? So I, we actually enrolled in community college together. And we took intro to, you know, we took uh, 10, English 101, we took geology together, we took um, actually anatomy and physiology, believe it or not. That was one of those, like, let me retake this course to teach you how to how to study. So then he was like, well, how do I study? You know, I'm like, okay, you, you can watch what I do, and then we can talk about what is it that I'm doing versus what you're doing. So we started developing strategies, right? Guess what he got that semester? A wild guess. Eights. All eights. All eights. So it's weird. It's this, this disconnect between systems not communicating with each other, right? The professors assumed his first round at a, a dry community college, they assumed that if he just worked hard, he just needs to work harder and he could get there. But in, then, in actually taking a step back, he didn't have the tools to work hard. You know? So it's kind of this disconnect that's happening with many students. When we say, you know, students need to come in prepared. They need to come in and do you know, X, Y, and Z. But if, never, if, if they've never actually been exposed to that type of environment, they don't know what that looks like. My brother was a perfect example of that. So then I said, OK, I invested my one semester, taught him how to take notes, taught him how to, how to study. This was amazing to me. And I already knew this. You know, but I didn't think. I didn't realize how much I had learned throughout was, what do you do with the material? When you study, 
I see students where they're doing their study guides like the night before the test, you know? And I ask myself, what's the purpose of that? You know, I mean, you, I would be different if they were actually writing a test off the study guide to take the night before, right? So it was kind of a mismatch. And he was like, well, I thought studying just meant reading the material. I thought studying just meant memorizing the words. He's like, no, you really need to learn how to put them together. You know, what are those concepts, the big ideas, right? And he was just blown away at, he's like, I just, I just never learned this in 12 years of my school. So I was like, all right, we're going to continue. So it was, a, it was a rough road. He had, you know, ups and downs. It wasn't, you know, just handed. But Mr. Juan Garcia here is a mechanical engineer. And his first job, entry-level position, $75,000. You know, and it was a year, and it was like almost unbelievable. I'm thinking, this kid that people saw as kind of a failure showed resiliency in different ways, right? It wasn't he just didn't even know what it meant to be resilient. He didn't know what it meant to to actually challenge yourself and to work with material and to actually master that material. It was this kind of weird. You're just going to continue and kind of follow what everybody does work on his problem sets for him without really understanding why why he did that. And once he got it, he became one of the best tutors that the university had. He trained all his tutors because he understood what it was like to be a kid like him. And that was kind of powerful too, you know, in terms of that shared experience. So we're all first generation college students. We who didn't have the, the support at home to say, hey mom, how do you do this? Hey dad, how do you do this, right? So that was kind of a disconnect too. Our environment was the people who were around us, they were our model for what college should be. So that if you think about as faculty members, you might be that model for, for that student. You might be the first person they know that actually has a college degree many times, which is kind of kind of strange to think about it that way, but it's the reality. So that's one, and I just want to tell you this story because I think it's really fascinating. Like I said, maybe you're one, right? Maybe you're gonna go through the ups and downs. Maybe there's a one in your life. But also, you might have ones as students, right? How can you best support them to make sure that they become metacognitive thinkers where they can actually say, you know what, this is something that I don't know. Maybe I should ask a faculty member um, for help or somebody else that is on campus. So today, I'm going to talk to you about five things that you can do to become a resilient learner. And for faculty, I want you to think about how do you support students in learning about how they learn, for example. And so we're going to go through five different strategies. We're going to practice a little bit. That way you can get a feel for, number one, meeting people in the room. And number two, actually, you know, getting out of your comfort and your little shell that you live in sometimes. So, so the first one is learn about your brain. It is fascinating to me that the most common way to deliver material is through a lecture mode in many classes. But the most common way that people learn is through interactions with each other. Such a disconnect, right? So that's something to think about in terms of how you study, in terms of what kind of questions you ask in class, um, and how you make decisions. So we're gonna watch a little video on neuroplasticity. Hopefully this works. Not so long ago, though, many scientists believe that the brain that did not change right. after childhood. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. I don't really like plastic metaphors I use, but you know, besides that, the, the main point really is that the wiring that has happened in your brain so far, right, is not set in stone. And I think that's essential for students to understand, and for instructors as well. You know, we have certain preconceptions about certain students, you know, based on their experiences and what they come with, but students just don't have it. It's unfair, you know, if you really think about it, it's like they just haven't built those connections, right? And when it comes to teaching and learning, many times what ends up happening with, um, with uh, the way that uh, many faculty approach, is it Emily? No. <laughs> um, if, if there is um, disconnected ideas that are presented, very fact-based, very like this, all these different things that are presented, right? But there's never an opportunity for students to make connections, then those pathways in the brain aren't developed, right? And what ends up happening is that students learn very discrete. For example, in mathematics, they might learn a procedure. They learn the procedure, but they don't understand the concept behind that. So when giving a new situation, they, they repeat the procedure, but they can't get to the right answer because either variables change or something like that. And they can't process what the, con the concept is. Physics happens all the time. I remember in my physics class, a lot of students would memorize, like, okay, you do this first, do that, second, second, without understanding the concepts. Well, what ended up happening was that the professors would be like, oh, well, now we're adding something new. And now I want you to transfer that knowledge into a new situation. But they couldn't because they never actually made that connection initially. So that's something to think about in terms of how your brain works, how essential it is to know that what the connections you have right now aren't set in stone. And practice really helps build those connections. It's very essential. And then really thinking about what are those opportunities to practice um, that you're exposed to or that you provide for your, your learners in the classroom. So this brings us to the buzzwords. Another buzzword that we hear in academia uh, uh, lately is this idea. It's called mindset theory. But that there's growth mindset and there's, a, there's fixed mindset. And the way you approach learning um, can really dictate what the outcomes will be. So for example, if you see, uh, if you approach learning through a growth mindset, you're looking at neuroplasticity, that intelligence can be developed, that just because you had a bad experience with a math class before, doesn't mean that that's gonna be the same experience in your, in your next um, interaction, right? That you can actually be more successful. Um, you embrace challenges, you persist um, in when there's setbacks, you know, there is a, there's a path to mastery. You say, I can't get it quite yet, but eventually, this is what I know where I'm at, and this is where I want to move toward mastery, right? Um, your, the disconnect sometimes that happens with professors, because they, in, in their world, we've lived, they know their stuff, but we forget what it's like to be a novice and a new learner when it comes, you know, so that's a, a, a mismatch that happens as well. So in thinking about how does, a, how does a professor think about this topic versus how I think about it, and what's the disconnect? Actually asking those questions is very essential. But a fixed mindset, and there are people in this world that are very fixed, and you know, because we've always done things this way, that's the way we're gonna continue doing them. They avoid challenges. Anything that poses high risk, forget it, we're not doing it. You know, we're gonna stay away from it. They give up easily. They say, you know what, it's too hard. I'm just not gonna get it, because you want, you know. Um, they see, I've studied 20 hours and I'm still not, and I still fail this test. Well, if you look at it through, I studied 20 hours and I failed this test and then you call it a day, it's not good I mean, because you're not really gonna get anywhere, right? But if you t turn it around and say, did I use those 20 hours effectively towards what the outcomes were gonna be? Was I studying in ways that would help me improve my, my performance on the test? How is the test written and how do I have to study in order to kind of make a match, right, uh, between those different things? And then if somebody gives you feedback, you just ignore it whatever, I know, I know better. Um, and then if you, 
I, I hear this one a lot. Like, I remember when I used to take tests, like, I would never, like, tell people what I got because I didn't want them competing, and I didn't want to compare myself to others, you know? But it was, I remember one time um, I had a, a test, and it was, um, I think I, it was, like, an 87 or something that I got in Bible class, and I was like, for me, it was like, it's not good enough. You know, in my mind, I, would, I had a fixed mindset, like, I should have done better. So I'm not going to show you what I got in 87. But then when the professor put the, the, the averages on the board, it was like, the average was a 60. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But then I thought, I cannot be comparing myself to the average because I'm not average. I don't want to be average. I want to be, I want to fulfill my own potential. And my own potential means I can score higher than 87. You know, that was how I challenged myself to be a resilient learner at that time. So they, um, students that are, that consider themselves very smart in high school, this is where they plateau, and they say, I had a 4.0 in high school. I don't know why I'm not doing well in college. Well, it's because you, the thinking is, I was born you know, with all this great wealth of knowledge in my head in a way that I'm not open to learning and making new connections, so you plateau. You reach a level that's like, that's all you're gonna get. You know, you're not gonna really move beyond that. So, that's the first one. Really think about your own learning. Really think about opportunities that you provide for students for learning. We're going to do an activity around this one. I think building a supportive network is the second key component of being a resilient learner. Why? Because you don't know everything, in case you haven't figured that out. <laughs> but you need people who can help maximize the opportunities to learn, right? So we're going to do a, a, a networking activity. And I want you to think about um, when growing your network, um, take, and I know not all of you have paper in front, you have paper plates, I'm just <laughs> but think, think about, okay, who is your current network? Like who, when, whenever you say, you know what, I'm just, I did really bad on that bio test. Who do you go to, <laughs> literally, to cry or to get help? You know, who is that network currently? Okay. And then for professors, think about how do you network with students? Like who's coming to you right now? Who isn't, right? So think about those two roles. We're going to do an activity in a minute. So think about that. Who's your network currently? And write that down. Are, is your mom and dad, you know, is your family network important right now? Are your same age peers important to you right now? Like your, your roommate, are they part of your network? So write that down. And then just kind of you know, put some thoughts together. Because one of the things we're gonna do after this is we're gonna really make sure that you map your network as, you, as it grows. You need to know how your network is growing. Because then, three or four years down the road, you might look back at this page and say, I haven't talked to Dr. So-and-so. Maybe I need to meet with them because they can help me get an internship with an engineering person. Something like that, right? So think about that. So I want you to just take a couple of minutes to do that. And then we're going to actually move and extend it back to the after that. <laughs> like, you can't enter it unless you have paper. <laughs> I should have. Do we have paper? That's okay. I didn't even think about, you know, one of those. <laughs> 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 it paper, yay. <laughs> okay. You can explain it. You need to get nothing. I thought there was a pen. Yeah. Oh, I got a pen on the end. You need one. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We can share. Mm -hmm. Is there my free pens that I've gotten? <laughs> Wait, I should write it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. oh, yeah. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> network.
Okay, so did you all kind of think about what are some of those connections? And you're gonna be surprised. You're like, I didn't even think about that. Okay, so the people in the room are kind of interesting. Uh, who we have right now? So we have Abby, of course, Elsa, and Tina as well. Um, and then, so I'm gonna introduce kind of the faculty, staff, people. So if you're uh, or beyond, you know, like the community connections. So feel free to kind of stand up and tell us what you do and what kind of what your role is at CSU Pueblo. I'm Jenny. I'm an academic director. I'm president of the leadership program. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kieran Hinto. I work with the Houston Department. Say that again? Oh, I work with the Department of Houston. I'm the next CEO. Okay. The local newspaper. Okay. Yes. The local newspaper. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. How are you all writing these things? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you need publicity? <laughs> like I, I know who to call. Okay, other faculty. Okay, so we'll go here. The engineering the department. Engineering, <laughs> this is the engineering department. How many engineering students do we have? All right, yes. turn to each other. We're going to notice. See clustering. No, we're going to stand up. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Letitia Stephan. I am the mass communications program and I'm the coordinator of women's studies. So women's studies, okay, very important when it comes to women's issues. Um, person to get to know, right? Now, as students, um, are you in, and I'm going to do kind of like the general big fucking major, so biology, biology, okay. Um, who is in chemistry? Notice, look at each other, go, make sure you're looking at each other, okay? Um, who's in, uh, is it, what's next? Physics. Engineering, I guess we talked engineering here. Physics? Who's physics? There should be one person in the room who's physics. <laughs> Statistically speaking. <laughs> um, Nursing. Nursing. Uh, what is that? Math. Oh, my math is all Um, Okay, who am I missing? I'm education. Education? Okay, um, what else? What are their majors? Other resources. Oh, Felicia, yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm the online writing lab coordinator, so I work with um, students to help them write their essays. Okay. And I'm writing. And then any other majors I didn't, if you're undeclared, undeclared for them? Okay, so I feel like I missed a couple <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make three new connections, okay? So, and I'll call time, you know, once so we're going to do two minute, kind of like a quick introduction, a speed dating style. You know? <laughs> so we're going to kind of get to, if you want to meet people who are might be your professors in the future, this is a great time to do it. Write down who they are, write down what percentage of courses they teach, you know? And if you say, you know what, I want to learn more about what the Writing Center offers. I want to learn more about what Propel offers. You know, I've never even, I've never been there. You know, what, what, what do they offer? So your job is going gonna, is gonna to be to make three new connections to add to your, you know, you can actually create a little map, social network, um, and add three new people that you haven't met before. If you already know the person next to you, don't say hi to them. You're not allowed. Okay? You got it? Alright, we're going to get out of your movies. Alright? Because we love going. Alright? That means faculty, you come over here. Come in. And you, you wait and welcome yeah. students. We cannot treat ourselves like a student. No, you can't treat yourself like a student. You have to make three new connections to <laughs> students. Oh, and for you, this is perfect. You need three students.
and what opportunities kind of were, were available to me. I decided to study abroad. Um, as a bio major, I was really interested in more of the ecological approach and looking at um, the education piece on how the community learned about biology. And so that, that was really my passion. But I actually started doing research um, on nutrification. And that's kind of like the, the loading of, of different nutrients into um, the ocean, for example, and how it causes algae, al algae, blooms, um, algae blooms and all that kind of stuff. And then it eventually kills the fish because there's no oxygen. So I was really interested in that. As an undergrad, I actually did research in Denmark. So looking at opportunities to do research were critical in building my network. But I also knew that I was really, really, I would love to go into the policy space. So then I looked for opportunities to provide exposure in the policy arena. And as a bio major, I was blown away at how many people had no science background in DC. So I, I actually had an internship through an organization called um, the National um, Association for Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, NIDEO. Um, and so they, I, was, I was afforded kind of a summer in, um, internship program for six weeks. And I worked for the Department of um, Housing and, and Urban Authority, I guess it was called. And I looked at how different trends and demographics um, mimic the opportunities available to those communities and things like that. You know, so it was kind of like, what causes what does gentrification do to certain areas? How do we continue um, providing opportunities for, for, for those things to lessen, right? Um, programs like the teacher next door and officer next door, things like that, I worked with that. That was a new experience as a bio major. I was like, 
Who would have never thought of putting those two things together? But now in the work that I do, I'm actually very knowledgeable about policy and how it impacts STEM education. And I'm also very knowledgeable about biology and also about education. So I was a teacher for eight years in, in, the, in my journey. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is you're not going to be one thing. It's really rare. I think the stats say you're going to have about six careers, right? So I heard somebody say, I'm like, yeah, I was a physics major, but I'm not now because I was physics before. <laughs> so things like that, but you know what? It's still applicable to whatever you do, right? It's not like you just turn it off. It's still those concepts really do transfer to whatever other discipline. And actually, sometimes it makes you even a better candidate for some jobs because that transferability is what employers are looking for, you know? So that's the meaning of the job. But there's also something that comes with this, and it is other people's expectations of what you should or should not be doing. Bias as a woman. Um, so we, talk, we can talk about bias, uh, and I'm just briefly going to mention what some of these terms are. You might have encountered them. You might have experienced what it is. But because uh, we don't really teach them in school, you might really not know, you know what, what they are. But bias or sometimes this idea of unconscious, when you look at somebody, things go through your brain that you might not even, you might not be aware of. You, know, you might not even know that you're thinking about. Um, and a really good example is, is the clock. You know, I call it the clock this week. You know, the student that was uh, pretty much profiled for bringing a clock to school, um, and his teachers thought it was a problem. Now, the interesting thing about that is, that student was a student of color, you know? That student happened to be Muslim, you know? So that bias that that, that teacher might have had, and it's very unconscious bias, you know? Like, it might have been like, I just really wanted to watch out for my, for my other students. But if she was would have been aware of that, like, I'm not, and saying, you know what? I'm not going to treat the student, like I need to know, like I, I had students from eight different countries sometimes when I, when I taught you know, newcomer um, science classes. And I thought about that, it made me really reflect as a teacher, what would I have done if, and I, and I thought of a student. I, I remember like, you know, this kid, his name was Abdullah, and he was like, you know, he, he was like, miss, let me show you this, miss, let me show you that. That was his way of interacting with me. And I thought, what if Abdullah would have come with, with this object, right? What would I have done as a, as a teacher, as an instructor? And the first thing that came to mind, I'm like, hey, Abdullah, what are you up to? What's that? Tell me more. They're like, oh, well, it's a clock, and it works this way. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's so awesome. That's kind of what, in red, what I would have done. And I'm hoping that that's what I really would have done, you know, because we, people are afraid of what they don't know. And that teacher not recognizing that it, you know, how, how do you make that call, right? But if she's aware of her bias, she might have taken a different approach, is what I'm saying, you know? So the more we're aware of our bias, and it might be sometimes, it might be as simple as if you have a student of color, you know, walking in one direction, and it's a little later at night, if you feel the need to move to the other side of the street, ask yourself, why? Why am I doing this, right? That's unconscious bias, and actually bringing it to life helps you be more kind of inclusive, but also question, like, why am I afraid? Do I need to get to know um, my fellow classmates a little more? That'll help me understand why certain people do certain things certain ways. That might be a way. Like, what if I, one of the biggest um, uh, missed opportunities that I see in college is the opportunity to work across cultures. So students that are similar in their cultures work together on projects, on different things. Um, but as instructors, what opportunities do we provide to build, I call it cross-cultural collaborations, where students are able to learn and bring their own cultural foundations of what they know into projects, and actually either for the community to make change in their communities, or to bring awareness. For example, um, in rural Colorado, one of the biggest needs right now, um, migrant workers, migrant students, live in conditions that are below what most of us would live in. You know, their homes are many times very old homes that are that have lead. So their kids suffer from lead poisoning. So mitigating those type of issues, right? But nobody really talks about it because it's those communities that don't really have a voice. But how can you as a student, for example, in engineering or in biology or in other areas, how can you do that advocate, right? How do you bring those social justice issues into what you
you're learning and into the curriculum that your professors are developing for you. So bias is very important for you to recognize. Like, am I? There's a test actually that you can do. Harvard created an unconscious bias test. And you can take it, and it's really amazing because when I started doing work on bias, I was a little more. I had more bias. Now I'm biased. Now, as I work more with students, I'm actually kind of like in the neutral category in a way. Like, I actually recognize it. So my response rates, do they put, for example, you know, I, um, I can't remember some of the questions, but it's like the idea of like, you know, I think women should be scientists. And I'm like, yeah. You know, I think that, so the, the quickness and the response um, kind of helps trigger if you have more bias or less bias towards something. Or women should be in education, for example or women shouldn't be engineers. Like, they give you different prompts, and the quicker you answer, the less, you know, the less bias technically they show. Um, but many times, people kind of, if they have to think too hard, they wait for the response. Um, the role of women in society, right? That's kind of an interesting one, too, because even for my own parents, I remember my husband, we are a partnership. You know, he does 50% of everything, and I do 50% of everything, and we, we team that. Like, right now, he has the girls, and he's taking care of them. He did their hair this morning, he took them to school, everything, right? Well, my parents see that as like abuse, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm gonna to my husband, you know, like, but in another culture, it should be all on me, right? And, and very much so in my own culture, you know, my parents think that my husband should just sit there and my mom will do everything like he did for, she did for my brother, right? It was not the case in, in the way that we decided to have our partnership. Stereotype threat is really looking at the what of my culture do I want people, I don't want them to think that of me. Like, and the best example is, you know, if you're from an Asian culture that you're smart. You know, like the, the, type, the, the stereotype, right? Oh, you must have gone in on that test because, you know, you're Asian. Or, you know, I mean, it's like, and you're like, well, no, I actually did really bad, but you really didn't do bad. But you don't want to live up to that stereotype, right? Or the same thing the opposite way. When you come from a culture that tends to perhaps be stereotyped as not performing, as well, then even professors sometimes question, why did you get an A in that math test? Like people like you aren't supposed to get A's in that math test, right? So stereotype threat is the fear of living up to the expectation of what is stereotyped in our culture. You know, for me, like being a loud Latina, I always give that example, you know? <laughs> so I always have to like really watch my voice because I don't want them to think I'm that loud Latina. But with that, Knowledge of this, right, comes self-affirmation. Self-affirmation is, I, and a, a really good story that I have for this one is my botany professor. When I was an undergrad, he, my second year in college, there's actually my second semester in college, I did kind of a major bio, it was a 130 for all bio majors. And then um, botany was the next course, and it was like zoology after that or something like that. That was kind of my sequence. And he said to me, I, I was in a lab, and the professor stopped and, uh, and the lab assistant was there. And then I was doing something, and I was, you know, being very careful. And he said, he goes, wow, he goes, you have a really good eye for that, he said to me. And I said, what? He's like, yeah. He goes, you're really detailed in the way you do your drawings, in the way you label your diagrams, in the way you're truly understanding. It was, you know, a plan of some sort. I can't remember what it was. He goes, it just comes so natural to you. I have never in my life had somebody tell me that biology came natural to me. So the self-affirmation that that professor, and he happened to be a white man that was like six you know, uh, feet tall or six five or something like that. He was super late. He was like, hi. Um, but the sense of like this person is acknowledging that me, a person who is labeled as a minority, as first generation, all these negative labels that I have towards my name, I don't even call myself personal minority because I feel that that takes away from this sense that I can become something better, and there's more to strive towards. Um, so he, uh, he affirmed that, you know what, biology comes easy to you. This is easy stuff. And I thought, you're right. And that was the easiest day I had ever done. Because, because of that sense of like, hey, I can work harder because now he validated something. It's always helpful to have that. I'm not saying it's necessary, but it's always great to have that validation of like, instead of focusing so much on what students do wrong, what do they do right? You know, you're really good at putting together these type of problems. But, and then actually the same, you, let's try to apply that to where your struggles are and actually bring that in your own. And then eventually, good and bad, it's like a wheel, you know? 
if you encounter self-affirmation and my self-esteem is boosted, say, you know what, you can be a, a great biologist. Then what do I do? I become a great biologist. You see? Same thing with the, any, any profession, right? Then it becomes kind of like a positive wheel. The opposite also happens. And it says, you know what? Minorities, I hear this a lot, minorities are the lowest performing. You know, the, the, the Latinos, African Americans are the lowest performing groups. And we need to do something to change that. But that message is putting it at, through a deficit mentality. Like there's something wrong with those students. And there's nothing wrong with students. It's really a lot of things that socially, culturally, that impact, right? Maybe they've never been exposed to it. You know, my one of my nieces is taking AP Bio right now, and I'm like, I didn't take AP Bio, but I thought, gosh, coming in with AP Bio, if she doesn't pass that test, the background knowledge she has, I never had as a first year college student. But I still thrived, right? So telling her that is affirming that you, you, you're one step ahead of the game. You're going to make it with the idea that her actions and behaviors will actually take her to that to, to that, to that um, outcome. So number three, take risks. And this is kind of a, I mentioned to a couple of you already, find opportunities to, and you know, this, the first bullet is in a very, I don't want to say in a danger, I didn't put dangerous situations up there. I said uncomfortable situations. Like even today, some of you are like, I don't talk to so-and-so, like I really don't want to talk to anybody. But actually taking that step and saying, hey, you know, my name is this, I do this, that's taking a risk. And that's good, you know, because many times, go to class, you sit, hardly ever talk to anybody, and then life just kind of happens, right? Um, being in uncomfortable situations, public speaking, another one. You know, just getting out there and actually being a, a voice for whatever type of movement in a way, like what is it that you're passionate about? And then internships, you know, we're looking, I'm, I'm thinking of internships like really getting that real world exposure. A lot of times, I remember as a bio major, I was like, yeah, at first I, I went into biology because more, like 90% of people in biology want to go to med school. But once I actually got into um, an internship, I actually did an internship at the uh, Los Angeles Pediatric Society because I was uh, in LA at the time. And the rotation was, you know, we, we did clinical, we shadowed the clinical practitioners and we shadowed, um, we actually shadowed the morgue to like, if a child dies, what happens to them? You know, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. We got that. And they did an autopsy that day. And I was like, mm, I don't think this is for me. You know, and it was one of those like reality checks that, yeah, not all pediatricians do autopsies, but I really would like forensic medicine. And I'm like, no, maybe that's not for me. It's just not what I want to do. But what it taught me was what I didn't want to become. So I started looking for other opportunities, and eventually I found, I'm like, I actually love doing a, a kind of a combination of different things. So I want to make sure I really get good at my skills. In, in different areas. I don't want to just say I'm biology only and that's it. Um, do research. I am the queen of research. I started doing research in ninth grade and it totally changed my trajectory for why I love to ask questions, why I love to, to know things, right? But I went to a high school that specialized in marine math and science and technology. And uh, we did research in Catalina Island. We were on research vessels. We would everybody drop just different things to sample diatoms, to sample all these different organisms. But I'm thinking, had I not done that, I would have never known what that's like. So get into labs. Like, that's a very good way to actually get really good experience on what does that world look like. And you might say, well, our labs here, they don't have that much space. They're not conducive to that. But guess what? There are labs all over Colorado, all over the nation, that actually have opportunities for summer research for undergraduate students, you know? And it's just a matter of making that connection. I had a student, uh, when I was working at UNC, he started... Um, in his, actually his freshman year, he started doing summer internships. Now he's a senior, he has four internships under his belt. It's just like, wow, that's pretty cool. And all he did was ask. He asked the professor, would, can I come and do research with you? And he was like, yeah, come over. Went to New Mexico one time. He went to uh, Santa Barbara one time, different places. So I think ultimately is, what I guess what I'm trying to get at with this is, Shadowing professionals is the next one. Know what the potential for those for what you think you want to become. Go look. Go look and see. What does that life look like? And do you really envision yourself doing it? Because the worst that can happen, you're like, there's no way I could do that. But at least now you know, right? But then there's also the taking risk part that put yourself out there. And longer than just a one time, you know, let me see what you do. Like really get to interact with that profession to really see if that's something that you want.
who uh, you, know, you could pursue, right? To build that resilience because they're going to care about you. They're going to want you to make it. Find a mentor. With that comes, once you kind of identify an area, find people that have done that before. You know, just like my botany professor, he gave me that self-affirmation. That, you know, I, he made me believe that I could do it. It was like, I could do this because, you know, it was kind of like an external factor, but it made me believe that I could do it. Um, for him, you know, it was like, oh, can you help me? Like, in a way, it was like he, also, he almost helped me learn about myself, right? But then I tapped into him. I said, hey, I need letters. I need letters of recommendation to get internships, to get, you know, field research experiences. Can you help me with that? And he became a mentor in a way, you know? And it's kind of funny because he already even knows that now, 15 years later, how influential he was in my life. Um, and the fourth is learn about yourself. This is really interesting to me. Like, students always send me resumes. And they're, like, scattered. I call them the scattered brain resumes. They have a bunch of things I've done, but ultimately a resume should be a reflection. And what you do, I do a workshop with students called the Backwards uh, Resume. And we actually do this, um, we do a couple of activities, but really look at what are you good at? What are your skills? You know, what are you, what are competencies that you've shown? Can, do you, can you use CAD? Can you use certain software in your area? Can you, are you good at um, designing things? Are you good at asking good research questions? Things like that, right? But then beyond that is, what is it, what are your hopes and dreams? Like, why would you want to do this, right? Is it to solve societal problems? Is it to develop new technologies to help, you know, humans? To help animals, to help anybody, right? What, what is it, what are your hopes and dreams for the future? I doubt most people say, I just want to be a worker that does the same thing every day, right? It's kind of a, a mismatch. But then your values is, like for example, for me, people always come first. You know, I build relationships with people. I, I really hope to leave a legacy with you know, the foundations that I work, with the organizations that I work. People remember me because they're like, you know what, it wasn't just like a high buy thing. You actually came back and built that relationship with us. You actually cared to ask, what are we up to? Kind of thing. So think about that. So that was one of my values that I thought um, and I actually worked for the state for many years, and that was one of the biggest mismatch that I felt was, even though their intentions were good in terms of advancing education, um, the mismatch was that it they didn't put people first. You know, I felt like it was a secondary thing, and and it wasn't a good match for my for my value system. And you can think about what are those essential values that you want to make sure is it caring for others? You know, is that something you want? Um, is it getting things done, being efficient? That could be a value too. You know, it really has, it depends on you. And then your identity, like how you, how you identify. So for me, you know, I, I remember really struggling with my identity, um, probably my third year in college. And then once again in grad school, because it was a mismatch. It was like a, a Latina in science. I think if we, were to put numbers to it, there's a four point, I think it's 4.5% of all STEM degrees are awarded to Latinas in science. It's like, so I'm one, you know, I kind of felt like, okay, if we were to count 100 people, it's four of us, right? But it probably not in the same institution, so I kind of felt like I was the one. And then with my PhD, only 2% of all Latinas in the US have a PhD. So I'm like one of like, I don't even know what the population is for Latinas. I mean, but I'm literally one in a million, you know? So it was a mismatch because even when people would approach me, they're like, hey, we're looking for you in the STEM or we're looking for Dr. Garcia. And I'm like, hi, nice to meet you. Like, for some reason, it couldn't be a woman. Like, my, my husband's more likely to be called Dr. Garcia sometimes, which is really ironic. But with that comes, how do you identify as a, as a person? You know, do you, do you, how do you identify, not just ethnically, but as a professional? Do you, if, are you developing that science identity? Are you developing that engineering identity? Are you developing that, you know, as an educator, for example, I, I'm an educator. I identify as an educator, but I also identify as a scientist. And that was kind of a really cool combination because most educators don't identify as scientists. So having that connection was essential, and I, I actually saw the difference it made for my students for me to be comfortable with science because the message was that it's okay to learn science if the message wasn't, oh, well, um, math is hard, so we're not going to do that. It was in a lot of elementary teachers without unconscious, unconsciously do that, right? And that's what the message I want to say. So, in conclusion, think about that. 
this idea of a growth mindset, this idea of building your network, this idea of building your identity, multiple identities. You're not just going to have one identity. I, my identities as a mother are very different. You know, there's expectations that come with that. As a wife, it's very different. Like I said, you know, we're equal partners. We're a partnership, and I call my husband a partner. So some people kind of take that, you know, like, like yeah, I'm like, yeah, he is my partner. We do everything together. Um, but with that, you know, people say, oh, have a great day all the time. And I am intentional about my days. I make things happen in my day that will help me kind of get to my next step. If for whatever reason my morning started off on the wrong foot or whatever, I really think about what could make my day better. And it might be talking to a friend, an old friend. It might be getting help. Like if, if, if my day started off horrible because I got a really bad grade on a test, then my next intention would be I need to go get help and this is going to make me feel better because, you know, it, it's going to get me back on my feet to make sure I do that. And with that comes a domino effect. Then you're going to have a great year. And then eventually, if you think about it, this idea of having a life, I don't want to say my life with no regrets, but, but I accept my choices. You know, and I'm okay with that. And it, it kind of changes the mindset. And it becomes this idea of a resilient thinker really kicks in because... You know, I'm, I'll give you my age. I'm 35 years old, and I feel like what I've done at this age is what some people, they don't even do that in their lifetime, you know? So that's something that I have to think about, you know? How, how do you live your life intentionally? How do you make things happen instead of just waiting around for things to happen to you? Be proactive and actually go and do things. So, thank you. I really appreciate it. And that's kind of, you know... <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or any anything they want to share? I'll open it up to the board. Maybe for some people who have more of a fixed mindset, what are little steps that people can take to be, because it is changeable, to be more of that growth mindset? Well, I think recognizing what kind of mindset you have, and it goes back to kind of thinking about your everyday interaction. Like, how do you think about this? So, for example, if you got a test back, what's the first thing that goes to your mind? And that can help you kind of pinpoint where you are. And if you say, you know what, this is just really hard, I'm never going to do it, I'm never going to do well, that's a big one. But if you say, you know, I got a 60%, that means I need to really rethink the way I study. That's a growth mindset, you know? So, even recognizing that would be kind of a, an actionable thing that you can take and actually make a change from that. But most people don't even know that they have a fixed mindset. They, they're just, you know, they just go about their day. And this happens to me in committee, uh, committees many times. That they're like, well, this is the way we've always done it. And I'm like, how's that work for you? <laughs> you know? But that's a fixed mindset as well, you know? So uh, that's where I push on this. You know, maybe you have to think of a different way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to keep getting the same results, right? So I think acknowledging kind of what type of mindset you have and it's not like one person is 100%, you know, growth. Yeah, there are days where I'm just like, yeah, I have to go fix my step too. But that trigger of like, I can't stay here. I need to go and do some other thing. That's what we need. And this is kind of an interesting thing. And I was mentioning to Abby that this idea, growth mindset versus fixed mindset, puts the, puts the um, what is the word, the actionable things on the student, right? It's a very, I'm going to clarify this. It doesn't mean that the space, the learning space they're in, is conducive to, for example, their learning space might be fixed. They might have a professor that does, you do two tests a year, I don't care what you score, that's it, right? It's a very fixed way of thinking. And if you don't do well, it's because you didn't study hard enough, you know? That's a very different mindset, whereas a growth mindset in a professor would be more like, okay, where are you at? And what is it that you're missing, and how can we move you along the way? I would say a lot of college classes aren't, people are not really thinking that way at the moment, you know? But opportunities to do that, open that growth mindset within a learning space. So it could be a mismatch, where a student could be like, yeah, you know, come home and want to do three things, but the learning space is so static, it's so set, that it's almost difficult for them to actually, you know, there's, it works for some students, but it doesn't work for all. And they'll notice I'm like, 
<laughs> you did just kind of answer the question I was going to ask, because I've heard people criticize the growth and fixed mindset as ignoring the effects of the system yeah. on the student. And the student can only do so much right. if they're, they're caught in that system. But I, but I think you're right. I mean, it, it does say, so do something yeah. yourself. And I think that it, it's a very contentious issue because it does put everything on the learner, but there's this type of, you know, if we want students to be 21st century learners, what does that mean for the actual space, you know, itself? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of room for growth, I think, you know, and actually examining where am I at as an instructor? Am I really promoting a fixed mindset or a growth mindset, right? Learn from failure. Engineering is like big on this, you know? We want students, we don't, I mean, my, my husband's like, yeah. He's so mad right now because he is um, he is uh, one of the project leads for the new um, light rail that's going out to DIA. And he came home the other day so upset. And I said, well, what happened, you know? He goes, I can't believe that the contractors, they, they're putting the concrete, laying the concrete you know, for the process, and it's off by two degrees. And they have to completely redo it for some millions of dollars. I just can't believe they didn't do it right. Or I can't believe somebody didn't check you know, what it was, but they missed this connection and that connection. There was another one that the wall was two inches off. So I was like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Two inches? That's a big gap, you know? And so then they had to, uh, they fixed it somehow, you know? But those are the type of things that you're like, when we talk about taking risks or accepting failure, it's like, well, yeah, you need to accept failure, but he needs to come up with a solution, you know? If you, you can't just sit on, oh, well, you know, that was failure, too bad, moving on. That's people's lives on the line, you know? And as an engineer, he has to be cognizant of that. But he gets so upset because it was like somebody along the way missed this. And it's it, it's like, how do you deal as a project manager? How do you deal with that, you know, and, and, uh, and the whole big scheme of things? So when people say, yeah, we need to accept failure, but at the same time, you can't just stay there because there has to be a solution for whatever it is trying to accomplish. It's a very real for, for him. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I caught all the students, but she didn't sign in this time. She's over here. Thank